Welcome back, everybody. We are finally going to get to write down the definition of what it means for a function to be integrable. So uh, everything we've been doing so far in this section has been leading up to what is called the Darbo integral. Um, this is not sort of the original integral. That was actually uh, really coming from Riemann. Uh, and, and so there is a small difference in how you define the Darbo integral integral between the Riemann integral. It turns out, though, that these notions are equivalent. Okay, uh, And what that means is that if you have two functions that are uh, uh, one function, which is both Darbo and Riemann integral, uh, uh, well, if it is Darbo integrable, then it will be Riemann integrable and vice versa. And if you compute the Riemann integral of a Riemann integrable function, you will get the same value as if you compute the Darbo integral, integral of a Darbo integrable function. So whether we use the Darbo integral or the Riemann integral, we, we end up with the same uh, class of functions that you can integrate and the same values of functions when you integrate. So there may be some pedagogical reasons we prefer the Darbo integral, but mathematically it doesn't matter really which one you, you use. So uh, let's get to it. Uh, so first, quick reminder, in the last video, we defined the upper and lower integrals of a function. So the lower integral was the supremum of all of the lower sums, and the upper integral was the infimum of all the upper sums. Okay, so remember, this upper integral is essentially giving you sort of the best overestimate of the value, and the lower integral is giving you the best underestimate of the value of the, the they say if you like the area under the curve, although that that's not totally working if f is negative or something. Okay, so uh, let's set it up as before. We have our function f from a to b, and it's going to be a bounded function. And so we're going to say that f is Darbo, although we won't usually write Darbo, integrable. So integrable. If, well, we have this lower integral, right? That is our, our best underestimate. And then we have this upper integral, which is our best overestimate. And if the best lower estimate and the best upper estimate are equal, then we say that the function is integrable. And in this case, we denote the common value by the more traditional integral that doesn't have a bar on the top or the bottom. Okay, And so this is what we'd call the integral of f over the interval a, b. There you go. Uh, so let's do an example. Now uh, we could do, you know, very straightforward examples with continuous functions. Uh, we're actually going to have a theorem that we'll do in a, a subsequent video where we prove that any continuous function uh, on an interval like a b is going to be integrable. Uh, but let, let's take a function that's not necessarily continuous, at least not everywhere. So I will go back to one of my favorite functions. It's a piecewise function. It is 3 or 1, depending on if x has gotten to 7 yet or if it's past 7. Okay, so if we draw a picture, uh, so let's see, we'll put 7 about right there. So the graph, before you get to 7, you're up here at 3. And then once you get down to 7, or once you get to 7, it goes down to 1, like so. Okay, so there could be our x and our y. And let's say that I'm going to restrict the domain to the interval 5 to 10. All right, so I can jump in here, and I say, all right, 5 maybe is going to be about right there. 10 is going to be over here. And I would like to know if h is integrable. All right, so is h integrable? Okay, and 
the problem from the point of view of the function, right, is that there's this big discontinuity right in the middle. Um, but from sort of an intuitive point of view, we, we, we shouldn't really be too surprised if this was integrable because look, if I want to integrate from five to 10, what I should be asking for is can I compute the area under the line and and yeah right like yeah even though there's this little discontinuity it's still pretty easy just to build these two two rectangles up right so this first one has height three and base two so this should be six this has uh, height one and base three so this should be a three so what should be the case so we expect is that if we integrate from five to ten this function h that we should get nine right six plus three Uh, all right, but let's go through the actual definition. All right, well, let's see if this this really works. So, um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to define for any positive integer, say little n. Um, I'm going to define a partition. So we're going to let x and I'll put the n up here it's not an exponent okay I'm not raising this to the nth power I'm just it's just a place to put an index okay and so this is going to be the partition that starts at 5 and then it's going to go to 7 why 7 well that's where this little discontinuity occurs then I just do a teeny little jump to the right 7 plus 1 over n when n is very large then of course 7 plus 1 over n will be very very close to 7 Okay, and then I'll go to the end of the interval 10. Okay, and so this should be, this is a partition. In fact, we can see, right, there's three commas, one, two, three. So this is a, a three partition of the interval five to 10. All right. Now, since I'm trying to show that H is integrable, I need to show that the lower and the upper integrals are equal, but each of those is defined in terms of, of lower sums and upper sums. So let me compute the upper sum for h here. So the upper sum for h on, say, this particular partition, xn. So what I need to do is for each of these intervals, okay, so there's one interval, there's a second interval, there's a third interval, I need to compute the supremum of the function h on that interval times the base size, right? So between five and seven, the supremum of H, well, actually H is constant from five to seven, right? It just has height three. So this will be three times the width. Okay, well, the width from five to seven is two. All right, plus, now we go to the next bit, all right? So here, I'm gonna have some seven plus one over N. And on this interval, where is the uh, the supremum? Well, at first glance, you might say, well, it's one, right? That's the, everything on this interval is one. But actually, remember, we get to include seven. And at seven, the height is still three. So I still get a three as my supremum times the width. Well, from seven to seven plus one over n, the width is just one over n. Okay, now we go to the last piece. That's from 7 plus 1 over n to 10. And again, it's not hard to see what the supremum is, right? Because it's just constant everywhere on here. The supremum is just going to be 1. So plus 1 times, all right, now how far is it from 7 plus 1 over n to 10? Well, from 7 to 10 would be 3. But you're not starting at 7. You're starting 1 over n over. So we have to subtract 1 over n. Okay, let's see. We can put this all together. And, all right, I have 3 times 2 is 6, and 1 times 3 is 3, so 6 plus 3 is 9. Then I have 3 times 1 over n, and 1 times negative 1 over n, so in total that's uh, plus 2 over n. Ah, so... The upper sum for this particular partition is given by 9 plus 2 over n. 
And we see pretty easily, right, as n gets large, this is going to converge to 9. Okay, so this, we'll just keep that uh, in the back of our minds. Uh, now let's try to compute uh, lower sums. Only this time, instead of using this xn, I'm just going to actually pick a very specific uh, partition that's even easier. So uh, let's let w... This is just going to be the partition that doesn't even have this extra 7 plus 1 over n bit. I'll just go 5, 7, 10. All right, so this is now just a 2 partition of 5, 10. And let me compute the lower sum for w. Okay, well, let's see. So between 5 and 7, the infimum, well, is it's just a constant function, right? So the infimum is the supremum is just equal to the value of, uh, of h. So this is still 3. And the width is still 7 minus 5, which is 2. Okay, and then we go to 7 to 10, right? There's just two of these now. And from 7 to 10, well, the supremum was 3 because you had this one point at 3. But if I'm doing the infimum, I don't worry about this 3 up here. I get all these 1s. That's the infimum. So it'll be plus 1 times now from 7 to 10. That has a distance of 3. 3 times 2 is 6, plus 1 times 3 is 3. Okay, 6 plus 3 is 9. Ah, so we conclude that the lower sum is equal to 9. But this lower sum, that's actually equal to the infimum of all of these upper sums. All right, so if I let n range from 1 to infinity, and I look at all of these upper sums, then of course I'm getting all of these expressions of the form 9 plus 2 over n, and the infimum of this expression is 9 itself. Okay, but the infimum of all the upper sums is equal to the upper integral. So this is the upper integral of h dx. Ah, so this particular lower sum is already equal to the upper integral. And I know that the lower integral is the supremum of all of the lower sums. All right, remember this. So LH is certainly, uh, at least of W, is going to be, well, here, let's write this first. With, we'll write the upper integral first now. So the upper integral is equal to this lower sum of W. But the lower sum is certainly equal to the supremum of all lower sums. So if I say take an x here and let x range over all possible partitions, well, I, maybe I won't use x, I'll use z because we used x up above. So I'll use a z. So if I look at all of these things, but, but this supremum is equal to the lower integral. Okay, but in the last video we showed that lower integrals are always less than or equal to the corresponding upper integral. All right, this one right here. So this lower integral is less than or equal to the upper integral. And look at that. We started with the upper integral. We finished with the upper integral. Therefore, everything is equal in between. So we conclude that the upper integral is equal to the lower integral. But that's our definition for h being integrable. If the lower and the upper integral are equal, then our function is integrable. So h is integrable. Fantastic. OK, so in the next video, we're going to come up with a uh, different characterization of integrability um, that's going to be, in general, a little bit easier to use, called the integrability criterion. It's going to be one of a couple different uh, characterizations that we use. All right, we will see you next time.